<laughs> oh my God, thank you so much for bringing us all together today and every Tuesday that you bring these beautiful women together, Father God, just to hear your word and bless BJ with whatever you want her to, to talk about and to teach us, Father God, and we're just so grateful for her and everybody on this call, Father. Thank you for our day. Thank you for our health. Um, thank you for Tabby's babies and G's new <laughs> trip to Germany and any everything that BJ has going on, Father God. We're just so blessed and thankful to be here and to talk about you and to praise you and to learn about you, Father God. Thank you so much. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Awesome. Great prayer. <laughs> All right. Go over to Daniel chapter 11. Daniel. Is, yep. Daniel chapter 11. It's been burning on my heart for about a week. I actually wrote about this in my blog this week. So... <laughs> Oh, cool. Couldn't resist. I came back to it. Daniel chapter 11. <laughs> that was so cute. Reggie holding the puppy. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be upstaging the word of God, Reggie. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. All right. So Daniel chapter 11, I really love the whole chapter, but I won't put us through that. But when you read it, it's literally like a movie. I was going, oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Oh. And it's really the battle between two kings. So you have the king of the south and the king of the north. Anybody know anything at all about all that stuff in the Old Testament? They were pretty ferocious. My dad would. My yeah. dad is all about Daniel and Revelation. Right. Then he would understand that I was reading it. I was like, whoa, they were intense because they were fighting for power. You know, who's going to be in power? So you've got the battle between the North and the South and then the South would be would win and then the North would win. They just kept going back and forth and back and forth. But I want you to see what took place. And then we're going to focus really on the last part. Um, so we're just going to pick up kind of in the middle of their fighting. So if somebody can just pick up 25, through 33, or 25 through 35 is what we're reading. All right, what is it? Daniel, Daniel chapter 11. Okay, 25 through 33. Through 35, 25 through 35. All right. You gonna read G? E, sure. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't sure if that was an all right as you, if you're gonna read or. Yeah, yeah, totally. Okay. <laughs> 25. Yeah, I was just trying to get there. Okay. With a large army, he will stir up his strength and courage against the king of the south. The king of the south will wage war with a large and very powerful army, but he will not be able to stand because of the plots devised against him. Those who eat from the king's provisions will try to destroy him. His army will be swept away and many will fall in the battle. The two kings, with their hearts bent on evil, will sit at the same table and lie to each other. But to no avail, because an end will still come at the appointed time. The king of the north will return to his own country with great wealth, but his heart will be set against the holy covenant. He will take action against it and then return to his own country. At the appointed time, he will invade the south again, but this time the outcome will be different from what it was before. Ships the western coastlands will oppose him and he will lose heart. Then will turn back and vent with his fury against the Holy Covenant. He will return and show favor to those who forsake the Holy Covenant. His armed forces will rise up to desecrate the temple fortress and will abolish the daily sacrifice. Then they will set up the abomination that causes desolation. With flattery, he will corrupt those who have violated the covenant, but the people who know their God will firmly resist him. Those who are wise will instruct many, though for a time they will fall by the sword or be burned, or captured, or plundered. When they fall, they will receive a little help, and many who are not sincere will join them. Some of the wise will stumble, so that they may be refined, purified, and made spotless until the time of the end, for it is, for it will still come at the appointed time. Okay, so you can kind of get a sense, even just from that little bit, of the warring that's going on between them. You got the South and the North and the South and the North and one is up, one is down, one is up, one is down. But I want us to focus on that last part. So the King of the North, when he finally, he started, he, he was winning. 
So he went back in the battle again, but this time the outcome was different. He lost. So now he's upset at whom? Did you catch that? It's in verse 28. Who did he turn his heart against when he started to lose? God. Yeah, now he's upset. So he's doing his own thing. He's in this wage, this, this battle for the South, against the South. And as long as he was winning, he was all good. Then he's losing. So he turns his evil heart against the Holy Covenant. It must be God's fault. Even though he hasn't been following God, there's no reason God should be blessing him. But yet, why are you doing this to me, God, is basically what's happening. So what does he do? He says he turns his heart against the Holy Covenant. And he takes action against it and return to his country. What does he do to the people? Did anybody catch what he was doing? Down, starting, I guess, 31. Mm. Actually, 30. Okay, the yeah. Half of 30. He showed favor to those who also turned against God. Yes. So mm -hmm. he's ticked off at God. I'm mad at you because you let me lose. And I'm going to turn against anybody else who's trying to praise you. So those who are mad at you, they're on my side. He's building his own little warring team against God. That's how upset he is. Mm -hmm. So he's like, if you're against God, yay. If you're for God, boo. So you look at it, you go, how warped can this get? But that's the thinking. And I love it goes on in 32. He says, um, yeah, 32. He says, with flattery, he will corrupt those who have violated the covenant. What does that mean? Hmm. He will, never mind. I don't know. I was just going to say like, with telling them a good job and telling them they're great and they're awesome, that he's going to corrupt them, obviously, by destroying the goodness of themselves, the righteousness in themselves, the right relationship with God. Um, but obviously it continues this, but the people who know their God will firmly resist him. So like yes. they won't be attracted to the flattery and they'll understand what he's trying to do. Yes. So he's making a distinction between, he says, okay, I'm going to flatter you. I'm going to flatter you if you're willing to turn against the covenant, turn against this God. Oh, you're awesome, Tabby. Turn against that God, girl. You don't. It's like he is bringing it on. He's like, turn against him. Turn against him. Flattery. I'm going to give you whatever you need. What, what do you want? I got this. Oh, you're the best thing. Flattery for the sake of getting people to turn against God. But it goes on and says, but those who know the Lord will firmly resist him. So how do we know? It says, those who know God will resist him. So the, the emphasis on, the emphasis is on us knowing God. That's cool, yeah. Knowing God. What does that mean? What is it they're holding on to? What do they know that would make them hold on? What do they know that would make them hold on to God is what you're saying? Mm -hmm. What do they know that would make them resist the flattery? What do they know about God that would make them say, no, I'm going to hold on to my God? What do we know? So we don't overthink it. Yeah. I'm thinking about Jesus, but this is like before Jesus, but mm -hmm. it's also talking about like near the end. So it could be when Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> I'm overthinking, obviously. You're overthinking it. <laughs> But just think if somebody literally, you know, today said, I would give you a million bucks if you turn against your God, what would you do? I think I would just look back to everything that God has saved me from previously and recognize, hopefully recognize that it wouldn't be worth not having that again, because I know I'm going to need saving from something else in my life, maybe not physically, but emotionally or whatever it is. So Right. Uh, I think it would be whatever God has already done individually, like the idea of no, we obviously can connect that that's um, relationship. 
So that means I've had a relationship with God in some way prior yeah. to this. Yeah. And probably those who were corrupted may have had less or none or didn't really grasp what relationship was. Right. Right. That was, that's good. G. If you think about it, if someone offered us a million bucks to turn against our God, we have to have something pretty solid to stand on in order to say no, because that temptation is so great. Now today, you may not necessarily have about offering us a million bucks, but what kind of things do the world offer us to turn against God today? May not be as blatant as that, but the world offers all sorts of things. Can you think of it? Relationships, success. Yes, relationships. And a lot of times we turn, we forsake God for the sake of relationships. Anything else we can think think of? I thought of um, like something that has always kind of happened growing up. Like my mom really wanted to be in the church and wanted to be involved in God, but like struggled with drugs so much that she would go to church high, but like she wanted to be there so bad. Mm -hmm. Um, So it's the first thing that came to my mind was like, we're given these opportunities to have one or the other. And sometimes like, I don't know, I know it's not direct answering the question directly, but um, like trying to have both and that you can't, you can't have both. I I don't think so. Right. Uh, Person that came to my mind, like, where you're being offered other things and then we're also being offered him. And then I think yes. that people are so broken sometimes that they want both, but they can't, they don't know how. Right. Good. Them. Good. We're going to look at that actually in just a little bit. So thank you for bringing that up. What else does the world offer us? So uh, relationships, holding on to both at the same time, which we can't do. Fortune and fame. Um, I don't know. There's so many things the world is always offering you know, you can have this wonderful job or you can have this wonderful this or wonderful that if you let go. And that is really what is happening here. The king is saying, you turn away from this God, I will flatter you. But if you hold on to him, which some of them did, he said, those were the ones who actually knew him. So for us, we've got to go, I have to know God because Satan is always going to be dangling that carrot. The king simply represents Satan dangling the carrot in front of the Christians. And they had to decide, do I know him enough to hold on? Or do I reach for that carrot, go for the flattery? And then he goes on and it gets a little bit deeper. Look down in verse 33. G, can you read 33 through 35 again? Yeah. Those who are wise will instruct many, though for a time they will fall by the sword or be burned or captured or plundered. When they fall, they will receive a little help, and many who are not sincere will join them. Some of the wise will stumble so that they may be refined, purified, and made spotless until the time of the end, for it will still come at the appointed time. Okay, let's talk about that. What do you guys see? What do you hear? It's an interesting little twist. Yeah, some of them are going to turn. Yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So maybe some are like, maybe similar to what Audrey's saying, like some aren't so firm, like maybe teeter- teetering on the edge of both, like liking the flattery, but also have some knowledge or relationship with God and like not being so stable for a time. Mm-hmm. And then eventually, eventually choose between the two. Mm hmm. Yeah. And it will probably, like it says, refine, purify, like make their uh, foundation a lot more solid through that. Right. right. So remember, he's talking about those who who know God was were firmly resisting. So he's talking about those people. He says, OK, so those who know God will resist him. But I want you to know this. That doesn't mean everything's going to be great because he turns around and immediately says those who are wise will instruct many, though for a time. They will fall by the sword. They will be burned. They will be captured. I mean, he's starting to, you're like, uh, then should I hold on? Mm -hmm. But he's letting us know it is not going to be easy. And just because we choose to hold on to God doesn't mean everything's going to be firm and straight and hunkadori and we don't have to worry about a thing. He says, some of you will even die. So this was some intense stuff. So we have to look at it and go, holding on to God, 
does not guarantee that we will not suffer, that we will not hurt, that we will not go through things. Word. <laughs> yeah. But then he goes on the end that g Red says, uh, some of them will stumble, but they, they it will happen so that they can be refined, purified. So whatever it is that we're going through, he says, there's a reason for it. And then he ends it with, it will come. At at its appointed time, the outcome is going to be good. But you need to hold on. But you need to hold on being sobered by the fact that bad things happen to good people. Being a Christian doesn't mean your life is going to be smooth. He said, but if you hold on, it will come to pass in the end. Is that making sense? Mm Mm-hmm. And this made me think, and it took us to, I wanted to take us to the temptation of Christ because we literally see it in action. So go to Luke 4. I also think, I'm sorry if I could add. Yes. Um, What was interesting about the king's nature was when God didn't show up was to make himself God. So to lure people to believe that he could give them these things and which is like you said satan so it was just very interesting how that's what i can do when i don't see god show up or when i feel like he's not there it's like okay let me take back control i can control everything i can have people under me listen to what i say i'm gonna rule everything now i have my own land and my own people to deal with and god thought they were his but now they're mine like right so it's just so interesting his nature was to flip flop Yes. To making a new God, which was himself. Right. Uh, so Very good. great point. No, that that's awesome. And we see that flip flop throughout the chapter. If you go back, I said, please go back, read the chapter. When he was winning, God was all good. When he was losing, he flipped. Mm-hmm. God, you're against me. So it's that back and forth. It's back and forth. And it does indeed. It represents us. How are we when things are good, when things are bad? You know, and that's what we're seeing in the kings. They're just simply battling for, for control, battling for position. And then we see the same thing in the temptation of Jesus in Luke chapter four. And if um, somebody can read just verse one through three for now. Tabby, can you take Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the desert, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and at the end of, the, at the end of them, he was hungry. The devil said to him, if you are the son of God, tell this stone to become bread. Okay, let's stop right there. So there's that temptation. He says, okay, if you are the son of God, if you are, I'm not saying you are, but if you are the son of God, Tell this stone to turn to bread. How is that like the king? What do we see there? Any similarities between what we just read? (laughs) Um, Kind of like when we talked about this before, like questioning his identity, but questioning like God, you know? So like, yeah, <laughs> not coming out. <laughs> yeah, he's literally challenging. Remember, he said those who know God will resist him. That's what we saw in the in, in Daniel eleven. So he's saying, oh, if you are hit, do you really know? Do uh, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that's what I was trying to say. <laughs> that's what. You- <laughs> So we start to see that same, do you know him? Do you really know him? Because if you really are the son of God, then you can do. So he tests whether or not he really knows him. And then he throws a curveball. And this is what really came to me this week as I was studying it. What did he ask him to do? Feed himself. Yeah. Do what? Feed himself. Feed himself. If you are something dead to life, yes. Well, not dead to life, but I don't know how to explain that. Something nothing, something nothing to something that is everything, like to people, like can feed people. (laughs) Right, right. If you are the son of God, perform. 
do something. Show me that you are. So we start to look at the temptation. This is how Satan erodes our faith. He challenges our faith. He says, all right, Audrey, if you really are Christian, if you really are God, uh, if you really do love God, then do this. Mm -hmm. Do something. Show me. Prove it to me. And what happens is, as people, we get caught up in a performance-based faith. How many of us, if, if we haven't ourselves gotten caught up in it, we know someone who has. What does a performance-based faith look like? What is that? When I say a performance-based faith. <laughs> She's nodding. I mean, it just looks lifeless to me. It looks like the stone. Like you're there but you ain't got no oomph to you and you're definitely not going to feed others. And I might, I'm not actually saying this, but someone might walk along the path and kick you out of the way. You won't be there anymore. Like it's just, you're just that. So um, yeah, I laugh because, you know, Bama podcasts and you maybe listen to this, the second episode of it, but they were talking about this, um, just talking about the performance nature. And I think mm -hmm. BJ, you talked about it too, mm -hmm. but how, everything in the poem from Genesis one starts with, and it was evening. And then there was day instead of there was day. And then there was evening. God wanted us to see that our day doesn't start with performing or doing, but starts with us resting and all that. So it just connected to what I was already talking about. Right. Yes. Right. Yeah. We have to be careful to not get caught up in a performance based faith. He was trying to get Jesus perform. Show me, do something and prove that you are the son of God. Satan is constantly trying to get us to do something to prove that we are Christian enough. To prove that God loves you. To prove that God has accepted you. And we, unlike Jesus, get caught up in it. We get caught up in trying to prove it. Okay, uh, I'm going to read my Bible more. Uh, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray longer. So we start doing all of this stuff. But you look at this and Jesus simply said in verse four, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone. In other words, he stopped it. He just went, no, I know who I am. I don't have to prove myself to you. I don't have to dance to prove to you that I am the son of God. Mm -hmm. And we have to grab onto that and go, you know what? We need to know who we are. We need to know God and know who we are with him so that we're not entertaining, dancing, performing for the sake of proving that we belong. So that's the first one we see. And then you see he goes further down. Uh, Audrey, can you just read five and, yeah, five through six, please. Yeah. I have my phone Bible and not my um, book Bible. So I'm so lost on the app. Okay. <laughs> so I'm still getting a hang of it. So if someone finds it before me, go ahead. Oh, okay. But I'm still. <laughs> All right. A, That's okay. Like crazy in here. <laughs> All right. We'll skip it. Just listen. G, can you take it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All um, right. Five through six. It says, and this is Luke four. If Audrey, if you find it. Thank, look, thank you. Look, thank you. Yeah. Look for the book, Luke, and look for chapter four and then scroll down. All right. The devil, oh. led him, the devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor. It has been given to me and I can give it to anyone I want to. If you worship me, it will all be yours. Okay. And I went too far, but that's OK. No, that was good. You went to where you needed to. What is that? What is he showing us? What do you see? Remember, he's trying to erode his faith. Do you really know him? What do we see in that little section? He's flattering him, like offering him the world. Yeah. To turn against God. Yes. Just mm -hmm. like the king. Just like the king. I'm going to give you, I'm flattering you. He said, I'll give you possessions. A faith that is based on possession, prosperity faith is what people call it today. You know, if you, if God is really with you, you wouldn't be struggling. If God was with you, <laughs> if, if you really are the son of God, you would not. And we base it on the things that we have or 
the promotions that we get or the blessings that we think, you know, it's like those things we attach then to being accepted. Again, he's bringing him back to if you really are the son of God, he's trying to get him to question his, his identity in Christ. How, is the, how does the world tempt us with possessions? Uh, lots of things. I mean, Reggie just now, like we have this offer to Germany, but he just got a call again saying that this other agent basically wants to steal Reggie from his agent to give him something better in Australia that could have more money or could have this. And we're about to sign the contract tomorrow morning. So someone that has anxiety about making big decisions, you know, that's like right. <laughs> obviously Satan. Um, and, it, you know, it just doesn't seem right anyways to work with someone that's very shysty and trying to steal people anyways. I mean, I know that's how the industry is, but for right. us, Reggie's agent has been loyal for his entire career. So why would we do that? But um, right. so I think for us, you know, that's one example of how, you know, it can flatter you. Like he tells Reggie, you know, I think you're an amazing player. I think you deserve more than what your agent is giving you. I think I can get you this. So why don't you sign with me and leave when you already have an offer on the table when you're right. already like, what? So yeah. that's a very right now <laughs> example. That's a great example. It's that <laughs> dangling of the carrot dangling of the carrot. If you know, I mean, it really, I mean, I know it's a stretch, but if you think about the example Jesus gave, if you imagine, and I know he's not, if you imagine Reggie's agent as the God character mm -hmm. who has been loyal, who have been there, you know, and all that stuff. And then in steps this other one going, if you do this, I can, that is the flattery that we saw with him. <laughs> That's what Satan is trying to do with Jesus. The only thing that will make Reggie say no is he knows his agent. Yeah, exactly. He knows him. He's been loyal. He can rely on that. And that comes back to, do we know? Those who know God will resist him and stand firm. And then we looked at third one. So we see that he tries to tempt him with a performance-based faith. We try, he tries to tempt him with possessions. And he's offering really everything he owns him. He already owns it, but <laughs> Satan's offering it. And then he offers one more thing. So look down in nine and yeah, first nine. Somebody, Tabby, can you pick that up? The devil led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down from here. Okay. Or, or That's good. Listen, <laughs> I thought that was interesting. <laughs> uh. All right. If you are, again, he comes back to, if you are, I'm not so sure about that, but if you are the son of God, throw yourself down from here. What was interesting about this as I was studying it, where's the here? Where, was, where had he taken him? Up to the mountain. point of the temple. In what city? Jerusalem. 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 So it wasn't like he had him stable in the same location as before, but for some reason he took him to Jerusalem and said, throw yourself down from here. Why do you think Jerusalem is important? Any, any ideas? The holy, the holy city. It was the holy city. Who lived there? That's Jews, people. Gentiles? Jews. Jews. The Jews. And Who were the people that believed in him the least gentiles so if those that will oh well all right well go ahead maybe i'm incorrect in what i'm thinking <laughs> remember he said um a prophet has no honor in his own hometown who mm -hmm. were those people jews the mm -hmm. jews so what he did you look at it he's tempting him he takes him to the people who disapproved of him he didn't take him to the people who approved of him. He took him to the people who disapproved of him and said, throw yourself down from here and then I'll believe it. What is he tempting him with? To see if those, if the people that don't like him would help him or save him. Yeah. The people that don't believe in him or that hate him. Yeah. Or that he trusts even people that don't believe in him. How are we with people, uh, how, how do I phrase this? Because <laughs> I, I can hear G in my head, or I don't care. <laughs> how are we with people who disapprove 
(laughs) Insecure. We're insecure. So we end up going out of our way to try to prove ourselves acceptable. Mm -hmm. So he brings him literally to people who disapprove. He's offering popularity Mm -hmm. amongst the people that don't like you. The people who like you, they already, they're already on, in your camp. They're already cheering you on. So I'm not going to take you there, but I'm going to take you to these people who have been against you. Throw yourself down from here. I'll believe you. They'll believe you. They're, he's trying to tempt him to show off in front of the people who don't believe in him so that he would be accepted. Popularity. How does Satan lure us with popularity or acceptance? today i think probably something that's relevant today is definitely social media because people really really thrive off of followers and off of like knowing the right people tagging people things like that so i think that's one of the worst ways right now that relates to that mm-hmm. that's good there's a promise or like Right now, popularity isn't like how it used to be when we were kids. (laughs) Everything is so serious now. And so like people make money now that, you know, there's a livelihood to make money off of social media and things like that. So it's just a whole new world. So that's the first thing I think about. That's an awesome example. That's great. You see the king? You look at it, you go, what was happening in Daniel chapter 11 in the Old Testament between the South and the North? we can look at it and go, it's exactly what's happening today. So what was happening then is reflected in the temptation of Jesus. And then if we move all the way to where we are today, we see the same thing is happening. Satan Satan doesn't necessarily change his tactics. Mm -hmm. We just become blinded to it. Mm -hmm. He was tempting them with the exact same thing in Daniel, tempting Jesus with the exact same thing in Luke. He is tempting us with the exact same thing today. What did the people in Daniel do in order to stand firm? What was the answer? Those who what? Will stand no, Those who know God will stand firm and resist him. What did Jesus do to stand firm? He knew God and who he was. He knew God and therefore he knew who he was. So with that in mind, what do we need to do in order to stand firm? No God and no, no God. God. Ding, 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 ding. ding. <laughs> <laughs> it's simple, but yet it's so hard to do because the world is coming at us fast and furious. You know, everybody's trying to, you know, we're, we're trying to make it. We're trying to make a living. We're trying to take care of our families and all the other things. And if someone says, I can make it easier. We're tempted to go, I want it to be easier, Mm -hmm. you know, or if we have to struggle a little bit, we're tempted to make some compensation and go, well, maybe I don't have to be that devoted. And that's why that scripture in Daniel is so powerful because he's saying, okay, some of you will stumble. Mm -hmm. Don't beat yourself up. It's just a reality. Some will stumble. Get back up. He even says uh, in that Daniel scripture, some people will follow you that are not sincere. Mm -hmm. What did that mean? Maybe they're following you for the shiny reasons and maybe they'll follow God along the way. I don't know. Yeah. Or maybe they won't. Yeah. It's like he covers all those bases. He's saying, guys, you're going to have some people who they're not really for you. They're just, you know, they're imposters. Mm -hmm. It's okay. You still hold firm. If you start to stumble, it's okay. Keep going. Hold firm. It says if you lose somebody along the way, you know, some people will die. Some people are going to get burned. Some people are going to get deceived. Things will happen even as Christians. He's saying, don't let that stop you. Because in the end, what did it say it would do? There was a purpose for it. What was that purpose? We'll refine you. What does that mean? All of our rough edges will be smoothed out. Oh, I love that. Yeah. He's saying, ultimately, all those rough edges, they're going to be smoothed out. 
So all those stumbles, don't let that discourage you so much that you go, oh, I'm terrible, I messed up. God's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So did everybody else. Mm -hmm. Keep going. It's just going to refine you. It's going to make you better. Keep going. Your job is to know God. His God is to smooth out those rough edges. We get it turned around and we start trying to smooth out our own rough edges. <laughs> and that's when we get in trouble. He says, don't try to do my job. Remember, like G said, the king decided he was going to be God. He flipped it over. We get tempted to flip it over. And God is saying, I don't need you to straighten out your edges. You can't. Don't, don't flip it over. All I need you to do, know me and know who you are with me. All the rest, I got this. Okay, so don't be tempted by the flattery. Resist, know your God, stand firm. That's all I got. Give me some feedback. Mm -hmm. Short and sweet. <laughs> I wanted to share a book with you guys that I read. Um, I probably read it like 10 times. <laughs> the only <laughs> book I've read 10 times. I read a lot, but not 10 times. Um, but it's something that's highlighted and dated and oh, written good. all over every year I do it. Um, it's called... If God is so good, why do I hurt so bad? Oh, by David. Yeah. I, have you read that before? Yes. It's a really good book. Um, and I actually don't know where it is because I moved and I lost like my Bible, my that book. Like I lost a ton of stuff on my move. Um, and so I'm going to order it again. I'm going to order that that specific book on Amazon. But I wanted to share that with you guys because it, it's a lot about what we talked about tonight. Like, well, if God is real. Like, why am I suffering or why is this person of cancer or why is all these things happening? And I used to be that way um, and just be very confused. And what I realized mainly when I started doing Bible study with you guys is that God has never really left, you know, and, and like, gee, I, once I told her, like I started crying cause she was like, you God like loves you. Right. And that, that really confirmed something for me for some reason, like I didn't know before, but I, I was searching for so long. And so that book is really um, helpful. If you guys are interested, it's a really good book. Um, it's, a, it's a short weed, weed, a short read. It's like this, it's like this big. <laughs> and, uh, and it just explains a story about a man and his family and, and his, um, his fight, his son's fight with cancer and different stories along it. So I just wanted to suggest that book for anybody. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. So if God is so good, why do I hurt so much? Right. Okay. Very good. All right. Tabby, any feedback? Thanks, Audrey. Yeah. Um, just kind of looking back over my sickness, over time that I've been a Christian, there have been a lot of people that have walked away mm -hmm. and people under my care, you know, who I had baptized, who were in my idea groups, who I felt personally responsible for. Um, a lot, you know, and that was hard not to like, feel like it was my fault and let it trip me up. Um, but definitely like holding on to, you know, just who God is, knowing that he gave them a choice and that it's not even over for them. Right. Um, really helped me to get through that. And then even just right now. I feel like he had to like physically slow me down and stop me and put me in bed to get my attention because the pandemic didn't do it really. <laughs> like, I was still just like eh, struggling. Um, and I just see like different like things that I put before him and stuff. And although it, it sucks and it hurts to go through for sure, like I definitely see the refinement and I'm, I'm grateful for it. You know, I've like put TV back on its very low, low pedestal where it belongs. It's like ridiculous how much I just love TV and want to watch TV and just get sucked in. Right. It's sad. It's so sad. So I had to apologize and fast and. Perfect. Awesome. Okay. Amen. So God gave you twins to slow you down. Very yeah. good. <laughs> it's like, I got your COVID. Bam. Here, carry twins. <laughs> uh, gee, any last parting words? 
I think it just reminds me, I think, you know, I don't know if I've had very many rock bottom times with God since I've been a disciple because I felt like I had a lot more before being a disciple. So yeah. like it's been a lot more like, oh, like thank God I have God <laughs> because everything else sucks. <laughs> but I do think what this reminds me of is the nagging little voice in my head that God is not good, that I have to keep going back over. Like I'll fight Reggie on it. Like mm -hmm you know what? He says he's good, but this, but this, but this, but why would he do like all these things? My mind will come up with so many things. So I've really had to fight to believe it. Well, not even that. Cause I actually, I think at a heart level, believe that God is good, but the thought keeps coming up. I'm like, so should I not believe he's good? Because, you know, so I'm like, okay, but just this idea, I've gotten to a point where, okay, I can surrender that. Yeah. I believe God is good. So even when I had the little, the breast exam scare mm -hmm. last whatever week Couple i mean it's ago. funny how those scares feel like everything and then they're gone and then i forget yeah. about it, right yeah. but um how i felt like just getting myself to a spot that okay so if i do have cancer that doesn't mean god is bad that doesn't mean i am bad right that just means that god will be with me through it and mm -hmm. then if you know it that could be the end of that time or right. it could mean i don't have it and there will be an end of time at some point but it's <laughs> just not now so i think what this just reminds me about is God's goodness. And mm -hmm. that's what I need to know about God to help me right. when I say I know him. Like, that's something that I can say, no, I know God is good. Cause I've yeah. fought it constantly thinking that he's maybe he has something else that's not good in him. So I just think the knowing part, when you say, what do we know about him? That right. would be something I would share with people is I know that he's good. So whatever's happening, there's, there's something happening for a reason for him. Um, so yeah awesome all right girls well i think it's a great little study like i said it's been sitting with me all week so go back and read through that whole chapter of daniel 11 it really <clears throat> it, it's pretty powerful i as i was reading it kept thinking this this should be a movie this should be a movie <laughs> because the battle is just so intense but maybe I, correct I, it yeah maybe but i think that's the that's the point is that the battle is so intense and god wants us to realize it is an intense battle that we're in and we can't just, you know, slouch through it. It's something we have to actively decide. I need to make sure that I'm prepared for this battle. And that means I need to know God. I need to know my God, because if I really know him, no one else can take him away from me. No flattery, no promises that are empty. All those other things that are offered won't take him away from me. So anyway, Ladies, that's all we got. It is coming up on 6.30. So we made it right on an hour's time. And if anyone has anything else, pull it out there. If not, we're going to go ahead and say goodnight. <laughs>